Suicide is a big problem among troops returning from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Can Vipassana help those who have experienced the horrors of war come to terms with their experience? Would it be too risky without a teacher's guidance? Okay, there's two issues that uh, are interesting to me here. The first one is the, the question of whether meditation can be risky. Medit it, it can meditation can in certain instances trigger and by meditation throughout this I'm going to be talking only about the meditation I teach okay so we're not let's be clear that what I say doesn't apply to, to all meditations for sure some meditations are extremely dangerous and from my point of view and and uh, but but uh, specifically speaking about the meditation teaching that I practice it is uh, uh, admitted that um, it can can trigger certain um, dangerous mind states that are already there that are that are lying dormant inside, but far and uh, away the most like how do I say this in in the vast majority of cases like ninety nine percent of the time meditation won't be dangerous at all. This, this meditation will only, only serve to help any condition across the board. So the, the question of danger almost never comes up in this meditation tradition. If it's A, taught correctly, B, practiced correctly, and C, maybe understood correctly, which, but understanding, of course, informs here. Let's just say if it's understood by the meditator correctly, whether that comes from from yourself, or it comes from a teacher, or from books, or whatever. Um, so, the question of whether one can do it without a teacher is a little bit more interesting, because obviously the most likely place to gain um, confidence and understanding in the practice is from a teacher. So if you don't have a teacher, where are you going to get this understanding? How do you make sure that your meditation is proper? I would still say, well, I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest answer here, or the biggest um, point to be made here in this regard, is um, that this meditation is incredibly easy to understand. There isn't much room for uh, error. Uh, basically what I'm trying to say is it's not it's not something you should worry about risk you know oh maybe I shouldn't practice meditation because it's too risky I think it's a, a, a um, it's an invalid or it's, it's an improper thing to, to to suggest or to think the meditation's innocuous it's more or less harmless it's not something that's going to hurt you the worst thing that happens in this tradition is people get bored turned off, afraid um, of the meditation, and stop meditating. That's far, far more common than any sort of risk, because you're not creating anything in this meditation. You're just looking at what's there. And if there's horrible, horrible things there, you just don't want to look at them. It doesn't happen that you get excited about looking at them. If there's no harmful things there, then it's easy, and, and the meditation proceeds smoothly. But the question of whether it's risky is not one uh, that I would be interested in entertaining. Now, uh, for people who have PTSD, and this is the second interesting aspect of this question, is what is PTSD, and what happens when a person who, practice, who has PSD, pr PTSD uh, practices meditation? And I think we have to broadly separate this into two categories of people. Those people who have um, experienced traumatic events passively and those people who have been active participants in creating traumatic experiences. And put it uh, um, being specific, those people who have who have done horrible things themselves, versus those people who have just experienced horrible things. 
from a Buddhist point of view, there's a big difference. Our claim is that it 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 it, it matters qu quite um, strongly whether you've done bad things or whether you've just had them happen to you. Now it may not seem like that. It, the, it, it, at first blush, it it appears to be the same thing. You are tra traumatized either way. So, but so that is that is how it how it feels, how it appears on the outside. You what you'll find is that's all, that's really only the 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 shell of the problem. That's fine. In the beginning, it's all going to look the same. As someone who's experienced trauma, whether they were the one causing it or whether they were the one, one they were the victim or the perpetrator, um, th there's little difference on the surface. But once you dig in deep, and once the person begins to to get the hang of the meditation, that's where it, the the two paths veer apart um, to a great extreme. Uh, a person who has experienced great trauma, no matter how great. Um, is quite capable of progressing in the meditation of healing and finding themselves and finding balance and, and becoming centered. A person who has done horrible things is far less likely to find that sort of balance and center. They have a corruption inside. They've been hurt deeply by their own actions. The guilt um, the guilt that a person who's actually done bad deeds feels is far more real, visceral, um, intense than a person who, than a victim who feels guilty or someone who feels guilty for whatever other reason. I had a woman who was raped by her father for, you know, when she was a child and she came to me when she was 40 and she looked like a ghost. And I've told this story before, but she was one of my greatest success stories. And I didn't do anything, you know. I, I never, I didn't, had no idea what had happened to her. I just knew that she came in. She looked like a ghost, and she was, had something she wanted to get off her chest. I mean, I guess she'd gone to therapists, and the idea was to always tell, and they would always ask what happened. I didn't ask. I wasn't interested. And I kept her in the present moment. And when she was crying, I said, "Just be mindful of crying. It doesn't really matter." why you're crying, be aware of the sadness, be aware of what's happening now. Anyway, long story short, after a couple of weeks, she was, she looked like a different person. She left, she was smiling and, and, and totally relieved. She came back and, and she, she had color in her face. She looked human again. It was really, she, she looked like a ghost when she first, she didn't look human when she first came in. And uh, when she left, she, she looked alive. A person who has committed bad deeds, um, there are cases where a person can make a mistake and realize their mistake, but a person who has systematically and intentionally engaged in warfare, um, killing other people, uh, there, there's something deeper there that you won't see at first. It's not readily apparent. The person might seem um, functional in society, but there is a, there is something that once that outer layer, layer is peeled off, um, you see the poison, you can see the corruption in their mind, and that's much more difficult. It can be healed, of course, but it's uh, much more difficult. Now, these people are the ones for whom it is dangerous no matter what, and even with a teacher, the teacher has to be careful, because these people are 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 um, susceptible to exploding, no? uh, uh, wreaking havoc on uh, on the meditation on meditators in the meditation center and attacking the meditation teacher. I mean, I've, there are stories of this where a meditator has you know, some commit suicide. Um, there, there are um, these are the problems. So. I don't have a quick solution for that one, and I think we have to separate the two out. And and the the best thing that comes from that, I think, is a cautionary ta cautionary um, you know warning to people, any pe anybody thinking of going into the army, anybody of thinking of going into the armed forces of any type. You you can't really go back. Um, it's a long, long road to get back to the state where you, you before you had done 
the terrible things that are done in, in war or any profession where killing is involved, even police work. Becoming a police officer is, well, if you ever have to kill, it's um, hard to go back. So, people who have PTSD, who are traumatized, these sorts of people, I think, we should focus on. Well, let, let, and let's, let's, let's make two points here. The first point is those who have done, in regards to PTSD for those who have done bad deeds, we have a very difficult and long road. And these people, if they're committed, then, then go for it. But they have to be careful themselves because their minds are going to be twisted and, and they'll be inclined to react improperly in the same for the same reasons that they reacted improperly before by killing by hurting by by harming others um, and and as a cautionary tale for those thinking to do it who, who think that killing is just an act and it's just one more it's just one moment and you can decide any time oh I'm not going to kill anymore it doesn't really work that way what's done is done a life can never be given back after it's taken and the other point is in regards to those who have PTSD from seeing death, seeing horrible things, uh, maybe even experiencing trauma such as rape or, or torture, um, starvation, whatever, and any kind of horrible thing that, that the side effects of, of war. Um, for these people, we have... Um, we have much more hope. Just one anecdote I want to say in regards, before I forget, in regards to the first group. Um, I, I spent some time with a man who was in war in when I was in California. He was married to a Thai woman, so he drove us around a little bit. And he was probably the most horrible person I've ever had the pleasure of spending, uh, of, of being in close quarter, quarters with. He said that People asked him what he missed most about being a soldier, and he said being able to kill people. I think he meant it, because his attitude to things was 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 horrible. The, the jokes he told were racist and, and, and you know, really cruel and awful. And and yet he would be sitting there, yeah, I think he was on he was on heavy medication, if I recall correctly, for PTSD, I guess. But he was a sergeant. Anyway, so that's, in, that's what I think of in regards to this first group of people who have actually done bad things. It's, it's quite difficult to ever hope to get to them. Something that we should think about. Um, the second group, those who have experienced the, the, the trauma, um, I don't see much problem in, in letting them meditate on their own. I would think if they have good theory and, and, and basic meditation practices, absolutely I would go for it. I would um, encourage them to pick up a book, start meditating, preferably in the tradition that I teach. Pick up my book. Um, it's the one that I plug, it's the one that I encourage. But um, absolutely, in this meditation I, tradition, I can pretty much guarantee that um, not a hundred percent, but ninety-nine percent guarantee that uh, nothing bad is going to happen, and you'll only start to understand your problems better. In fact, the more you learn, the more you read, the more you study, um, the more you'll be able to deal with fear, anxiety, stress, paranoia, etc., and be able to overcome all sorts of stress. I mean, if this woman who was raped by her father can do it, I. It's hard to find something something worse than that. 